So Abraham sent his servant to find a bride for Isaac. And he sent camels, verse 10 tells us in Genesis chapter 24. The servant took ten camels of the camels of his master and departed, for all the goods of his master were in his hands. These camels were loaded with gifts for the prospective bride and her family. And in verse 22, the servant, after Rebekah had drawn water from the well, watered the servant's camels, and after she had done that, then the servant took a golden earring of half a shekel weight and two bracelets for her hands of ten shekels weight of gold. Now, this is the beginning of this first step of the marriage being arranged. And like I said, it is foreign to us. This is, this, we don't go through this shittokim, this matchmaking stage in, in our day today, but they do in Jewish families. And in verses 50 through 53, you'll need to read this whole chapter. And then continuing on verses 58 through 65, the Jewish fathers, they will arrange all of the details for this marriage between the young Jewish boy and the young Jewish girl. And in these verses, we have the negotiations. The, the two fathers will sit down. They will write out a marriage contract called a ketubah. And after all of the negotiations take place, then and only then is the young girl involved. She hasn't said a word. She hasn't even been asked, what do you think about this? No, she hasn't said a word, hasn't been involved until verse 58. They called Rebecca. They said unto her, Wilt thou go with this man? Do you want to leave your home never to return? Do you want to go to this foreign country? And do you want to marry a young boy that you have never even seen? Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to give up your life, your family, your home, and go and marry a young boy that you've never seen before and live in his house for the rest of your life? Wilt thou go with this man? And she said, I will go. Oh, and then all of the, the servant and all of the men that accompanied him, Rebecca and her servants, her bridesmaids, her maidens, they accompanied her. They began the journey back to Abraham's home. And as they go, and when they come close to the, to the home of Abraham, it, the scripture tells us that Isaac went out to meditate in the field in the evening. And he looked up and he saw the caravan. He saw the camels were coming. And then Rebecca, she looked up and she saw this young man walking in the field. She asked the servant, who is this? And the servant said, this is my master's son. So Rebecca took a veil and she covered herself for 65. That was a custom in, in Bible days for the young Jewish bride-to-be to wear a veil after this betrothal stage. Now think about this. Rebecca married a man whom she had never seen. You and I will marry Jesus, our beloved bridegroom, whom we have never seen. Rebecca went to live in a home that she had never seen. You and I will go and live in a home that we have never seen. We will go to heaven and live forever with our beloved bridegroom. Think about it. Are we willing to marry a man that we've never seen? Oh, I am, are you? In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 8, says, Who? Having not seen, ye love. 
in whom though now you see him not yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Oh, isn't this beautiful? I love this. Now, let's learn about the Jewish marriage proposal. Now, when a young Jewish boy reached marrying age, his family selected a bride for him. He did not choose the bride himself. A Jewish boy and his father would go to the home of a young Jewish girl, and they brought three things with them. They brought the mohar, which is money for the bride price. They brought a marriage contract called a ketubah, and they brought a skin of wine. Now, the young Jewish boy and his father met with the young Jewish girl and her father to negotiate this mohar, the bride price. And when negotiations were complete, the custom was for the young man's father to pour a cup of wine and present it to the young girl. So I've asked a couple to help me do this illustration. If you would come up at this time. The young Jewish boy and his father, they would go to the young Jewish girl's home. And as they went, they took three things with them. As I said, they would take, you can come up and sit down. As I said, they would bring three things with them. They would bring the mohar, the money, or the bride price. They would bring the ketubah, the marriage contract. They would bring a skin of wine. So, if you'll sit down, the two Jewish fathers, they made all of the negotiations. They went over the terms of this wedding, what this young Jewish boy would provide for this young girl, how he would take care of her, how he would provide for her all of the days of his life, how he would serve her, how he would take care of her and be good to her. All of these negotiations were written down in a ketubah, a marriage contract. And then it was a custom in Bible days, after the negotiations were complete, the Jewish father of the young Jewish boy, he would pour a cup of wine and he would present that cup to his son. His son would in turn hold that cup of wine out to this young Jewish girl and he would set it down in front of her. Now, this young Jewish girl at this time, she is this the first time she's been consulted. She hasn't said a word. The Jewish fathers have done all the talking, all the negotiations. Now, she could push that cup of wine back across the table without saying a word. That was her way of saying, no, I do not accept your proposal. I will not marry you. But she had to think long and hard before she refused that marriage proposal because if she said no, the young boy and his father got up, they left that house, and they never came back. So it was such a stigma in Bible days for a young Jewish girl not to be married and not to give birth to children, especially male children, to carry on the family name. So this young girl had to think long and hard before she refused that marriage proposal. She might never get another proposal. So she could take her time. She could read the ketubah. She could hmm, say, now, is he really going to fulfill all these promises? Is he really going to take care of me for the rest of my life? She could even count them on heart. She could say, now, is this enough money? Is this really going to be enough money to take care of me if my husband dies? Is this really going to be enough money for me? She could take her time. And then when she made the decision that, yes, 
I will accept your marriage proposal. All she did was pick that cup up and drink from that cup without saying a word. That was her way of saying, yes, I accept your marriage proposal. I will marry you. I will be your bride. And at that time, they sat down at the table. They shared a meal of bread and wine. And when that cup of wine was finished, that was the last part of the Jewish marriage proposal. When that cup was finished, the young Jewish boy and his father would get up. And the young Jewish boy would say, I go to prepare a place for you. And he goes back to his father's house and he begins to build a little mansion or a little room on his father's house. Now, during this time of the betrothal, it's a time of separation. They don't see each other. The betrothal stage in a Jewish marriage proposal normally lasts at least a year. Sometimes it can last even five years before the actual marriage ceremony. So during this time of separation, the young Jewish girl, while this young Jewish boy is building a little room, a little mansion, if you will, onto his father's house, the young Jewish girl is making preparations. She is getting herself ready to become the bride. She will burn a lamp in her window each night. And she will keep a lamp by her bed. She'll keep oil in that lamp. She'll keep that wick trimmed so that it will burn brightly. She is preparing herself, getting herself ready to become the bride. Now, she doesn't know when he will come for her, but she must be ready at all times. And if any time during this betrothal stage, any time during this separation stage, that she goes out of her house, she must wear a veil over her face. A covering, a veil signified to the other young Jewish boy that, boys that, hey, I'm not available. I'm spoken for. I'm engaged. A price has been paid for me. I have been bought with a price. I'm no longer my own. I belong to someone else. I am betrothed to my beloved. Now, during this time of separation, the young Jewish boy will send gifts to his prospective bride. They don't see each other. They don't speak to each other during this time of separation. But during the time of separation, the young Jewish boy will send gifts to his prospective bride. It will be gifts to beautify her to encourage her, to let her know that yes, I haven't forgotten you, and yes, I will be coming back for you. So he will send her gifts. And inside, it may be perfume, it may be clothing, whatever it is that will beautify her, that will make her more lovely for him when he comes. Now, the Jewish father, he determines the wedding day. The young Jewish bride, she doesn't know when her bridegroom will come for her. And the young Jewish boy himself does not know when his father will send him to get his bride. Only the father knows when the wedding day will be. And from time to time, he will inspect this room to make sure it's well built and as beautiful as they can afford to make it. Because if it was up to the young Jewish boy, he would just throw anything together. He'd nail it up and he'd be crooked and he'd use just whatever material he could find. Because he wants to go get his woman. He wants to go get his bride. But it's not up to the young Jewish boy. It's up to the father. And the father, when he has inspected this room, when he determines that everything is in order, 
he will say to his son, son, it is time. Go get your bride. And when he says, son, it's time for the wedding. Go get your bride. Then the bridegroom, he will put on his, his garments, of, of his royal robe, and there will be a garland upon his head. He will dress himself in the very finest clothes that his father can afford to give him. And at, they will leave the wedding party, the bridegroom, and his bride, his the groomsman's men who will accompany him. They will all leave the father's house. They'll be singing, shouting, dancing. They'll be rejoicing as they go from the father's house to go to the bride's home to get her. And as they go forth, there, there, there's a lot of clamor. There's music and dancing. But when they get close to the bride's house, a herald will be sent forth to go before the bridegroom and his company. And that herald will go down the streets of, of the city. And he'll make sure that everything is quiet, that everything it is in order. And that herald will announce, Hine, Hakatan, behold, the bridegroom comes. And when, when the young Jewish girl heard the sound of the call of behold the bridegroom comes she knows that he'll be there for her in only a moment and she she gets on her wedding dress her bridesmaids will help her to get dressed she'll put that veil on her face she'll light that candle that she's been keeping by her bed and they will go down in out of the house down into the street to meet the bridegroom and his company and when they go and they will stand face to face before one another and remember she's veiled he can't see her face and so the bridegroom will say to her remove your veil and she'll hesitate she'll think what if he no longer thinks i'm beautiful it's been at least a year it's been over a year. What if he just thinks I'm ugly? What if I've gotten too many wrinkles? Oh, I don't want to remove my veil. What, what if he no longer wants to marry me? She hesitates, but he says, remove your veil. So she reluctantly will remove that veil. He will look at her and say, oh, I find no fault with you. You are altogether lovely. I have come for you. And so the bride and the groom, they will be placed in a bridal chariot. It's called in Hebrew a perion. And they will be lifted up in the air. The, the bridegroom's men will lift them up. They will carry them back through the streets of the city. Now there's going to be shouting. Now there's going to be rejoicing. Now there's going to be a celebration as they go back down through the streets, singing, rejoicing, and the people of the town, they're getting up, they're lighting their lamps, they're coming down out in the streets to rejoicing and shout with them because the wedding celebration is taking place and they'll go back to their father's house and they'll be welcomed with brokers, with blessings, welcome bride, welcome bridegroom. And there they will sit under the wedding canopy called the hoopah. And there they'll watch the, the, the dancing, the music, the celebration. And there during that time, they will quickly slip away into the bridal chamber where they, the two will become one and the marriage celebration is complete. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. Isn't that awesome? Oh, I love that, don't you? The Jewish marriage proposal. Think about that. When that's foreign to us, we just get engaged, and then if we don't decide we don't want to get married, we'll say, oh, wedding off, engagement off. I don't, I've changed my mind. I don't want to marry you. But in Bible days, it was not so. During that 
that betrothal stage, they were considered to be married. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 31, this betrothal stage was so legal, it was so binding, that if they wanted to not to marry each other, they had to get a writ of divorcement, the scripture says, or a writing of divorce, a certificate. Matthew 5, 31, whoever shall put away his wife, they're not married. They're just in that betrothal stage. Let him give her a writing of divorcement or a certificate of divorce. That's why Joseph, when he found out that Mary was pregnant, he thought to put her away privately, the King James says, in Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 19. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When, as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, they're not married, but that betrothal in in. Bible days was such a legal binding contract when they signed that ketubah, that betrothal was so legal, so binding, he was considered to be the husband, she was considered to be the wife. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately or divorce her. Now, after this betrothal, after the ketubah, the marriage contract is signed, from that moment on, the bride, she is called the kala. In Hebrew, it means the bride. And the young Jewish boy is called the, the katan, which means the bridegroom. And in Hebrew, this Hebrew word katan comes from a word that means one who joins himself in love. Oh, I love that. During this betrothal period, like we showed you in the illustration, this young Jewish boy, they don't see each other, but he will send gifts to the young Jewish girl called the Matan. It's different now from the Mohar, the bride Christ. It's different. The, the Matan is gifts to beautify her and to reassure her that he's coming for her and to help her to make herself ready to be his bride. Do you know what the gift that our beloved bridegroom sent to us is? The gift of the Holy Spirit to help beautify us with the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace. To help beautify us, to help us to be prepared for our beloved bridegroom when he comes for us. Oh, I, I love this, I love this, I love this. I can teach on this every day. And when I had my Bible study, and the, after the very first time I taught on that cup, every few weeks they said, when are we gonna have communion? Can we have communion again? Because it was, it, it was so life-changing and transforming for, for them when they learned the significance of the cup after supper, that third cup, which Jesus picked up and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Now, during that time of separation, this young Jewish girl, she would mikvah herself or bathe herself ritually often. And she would put on all of the beauty treatments that was available in Bible days, just like Esther, chapter 2, verse 12. Esther spent 12 months beautifying herself, six months with oil of myrrh, six months with the sweet odors, in order, in order to prepare herself to go into the presence of the king. So this young Jewish girl, she spent that time of separation, preparing herself, beautifying herself, with the fragrant perfume, all of the beauty treatments to make herself as beautiful as she could possibly be when her bridegroom came for her. And in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 10, the scripture says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord, for he has clothed me with the garment of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decketh himself with the ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. Oh, it was also customary. If, if the young Jewish bride's family was poor and couldn't afford jewelry, then they would borrow from their neighbors jewels of gold 
sapphires, whatever jewelry they could they could borrow. And during that time of separation, this young Jewish girl also had to prepare her wedding dress. She had to get everything ready for her bridegroom to come. And like we illustrated it, she burned a lamp in her window each night to say, hey, this is my house. Don't miss it. You're going to come for me. And she kept another lamp by her bed, kept oil in the lamp, kept that wick mm -hmm. trimmed so that it would burn brightly when her bridegroom came for her. She didn't know when he was going to come. And like I said, the young Jewish boy himself did not know when his father would send him for his bride. Only the Jewish father knew the day of the wedding. And then on the wedding day, that's the third stage of a Jewish marriage proposal. It's the Nisuin, the actual marriage ceremony. And just as we illustrated, on that wedding day, the bridegroom and his groomsmen and they would leave the father's house. It was a time of rejoicing, a time of celebration. Why? Because it was the, the hatuna, the wedding day. And then when they sent that wedding party out, that herald, just like I said, when, when they got close to the, per, the prospective bride's home, that herald would, would go before the bridegroom and his company, and that herald would announce, Hine, hakatan, behold, the bridegroom comes, and like we illustrated, as soon as that that sound was heard, as soon as the announcement came, that young Jewish girl, she would get up, put on her wedding gown, and her bridesmaids would assist her. She would put on her veil and get that lamp, light that lamp that she kept by her, her bed, and then go down into the street to meet the bridegroom and his company. The Kala, the bride-to-be, would go down to meet the Katan, the, the bridegroom, and he would say to her, just as Song of Solomon says, the scripture says in chapter 3, verses 7 through 10, the King Solomon had a bridal chariot ready for his bride. Behold his, bread, his bed, which is Solomon's, Three score valiant men were about it. This bridal chariot was so big it took 60 men to carry it. Mm. King Solomon himself made a chariot of the wood of the Lebanon. Oh, it was beautiful. It was gold on the outside that, and beautiful gold on, and wood on the inside. And, the, and it was arrayed with beautiful purple cloth, the most expensive color in Bible days. And the wedding ceremony, the, as, as they would go back down through the streets of the city, going back to the Father's house for that wedding ceremony, they would be singing and shouting and rejoicing. The words from Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 34, Kol Sosom, Kol Simcha, Kol Katan, Kol Kala, the voice of myrrh, the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, and the voice of the bride. That would be what they would be shouting and singing. And in the distance, as they approached the father's house, the young Jewish bride-to-be could see the lights of her new home. She had never saw this new home before, but she would live in that home with her, her beloved bridegroom for the rest of their lives. And when they approached the father's house, there would be Ruka's blessings, and they would be crowned with gold crowns. They would sit under the hookah, that, that canopy, and they would sit there as kings and queens because that was their day. That was the day of their marriage. And what does all this mean to us? Jesus came from his father's house to earth, to our house. He brought with him the ketubah, the marriage contract, the new covenant. He poured that third cup of wine at that Passover table that night with his disciples. He poured that 
third cup of wine called the cup of redemption at that Passover table. He presented that cup of wine to his disciples in Matthew chapter 26, verse 28. And he said, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you. Shed for you. Oh, and today Jesus presents this cup of wine at the communion table. He's presenting us a marriage proposal. We take the cup, we drink the cup, and we wait for him. He paid the bride price, the mohar for us. Not with money. No. Not with silver or gold. No, the mohar, the bride price that our beloved bridegroom paid for us was the price of his laid down life, his poured out blood. And then he said, I go to prepare a place for you. And Jesus is now in heaven. He is preparing that bridal chamber for you and for me. Jesus said to his disciples in John chapter 14, verses 2 through 3, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. The exact same words that the young Jewish boy says to the young Jewish girl. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am there, ye may be also. Oh, Thank you, Lord. and during this time of separation, he is in heaven building a mansion, a bridal chamber for you and I. We are here on this earth. This is the time of separation. And what are we to do? We're to be that bride. We, bride to be, we're to be making ourselves ready. We've been bought with the mohar, the bride price. We're set apart. We're consecrated. We're not our own. First Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 through 20. You're not your own, for you're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Our beloved bridegroom has bought us with the price of his laid down life, his poured out blood. The church is the bride of Christ. And every time we approach that communion table and pick that cup up and drink from that cup, we are accepting his marriage proposal. Thank you. Just as that young Jewish girl accepted the marriage proposal by picking that cup up and drinking from that cup. And then she had to prepare herself to be that bride. And we are to cleanse ourselves. We are to prepare ourselves to be his bride. Revelation chapter 19 verses 7 through 9 says, The marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Mm. Notice it says the wife has made herself ready. Being a part of the bride company is not automatic. There's a price to be paid. We have to make ourselves ready. Yes. Psalms chapter 45, verses 13 through 15. The king's daughter is all glorious within. Her clothing is of wrought gold. She shall be brought into the king in raiment or tapestry of needlework. The virgins, her bridesmaids, her companions that follow her shall be brought unto thee with gladness and rejoicing. Yes. Shall they be brought? They shall enter into the king's palace. Think about this. The bride has made herself ready. Every act of obedience, every kind word, every time we yield our will to his will, every time we say, not my will, but yours be done, every time we choose to die to our Come flesh, on. we are making ourselves more beautiful. We are weaving our garment that we will wear throughout eternity. Think about that. But we need help, don't we, in making ourselves ready to be his bride. And Jesus has given us the gift of the precious Holy Spirit to help us to make ourselves ready, help us cleanse ourselves, help us to prepare ourselves to be his bride. Now, not only are we to be making ourselves ready, preparing ourselves, but we must watch because we don't know when our bridegroom will come for us. And just as we don't know, Jesus himself does not know when his father will send him for his bride. Mark chapter 13, verse 32 tells us that only the father knows 
Only the Father knows when, when he will send Jesus for us, his bride. But on that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. So when we approach the communion table and Jesus is presenting that cup of wine to us in a marriage proposal, he is the hakatanim. He is the bridegroom of all bridegrooms. If we're willing to look for him, wait for him, and make ourselves ready for him, if we're willing to give our lives in order to become his bride, then we pick that cup up at the communion table. We drink that cup and we wait for him. And, and Jesus is now in heaven preparing that mansion for us. One for you, one for you, one for each of us. And when the father says, son, go get your bride. The, everything is ready for the wedding. The wedding preparations have been made. Son, go get your bride. The angelic host will accompany Jesus, our bridegroom. And one of the angels, after God the Father himself sounds that shofar, the ram's horn, then an angel will announce, hakatan, behold, the bridegroom comes. Praise the Lord. Lord will descend from heaven with a shout. First Thessalonians chapter 4, 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. God will blow that shofar. The angel will announce, Behold, the bridegroom comes, and Jesus will come, and he will stop at your house, in your house. He will stop at each one of our houses and take us to be with him to become his bride. And Jesus is now preparing that marriage celebration for us. The marriage Thank supper you. of the Lamb. Matthew chapter 26, verse 29. Jesus is preparing a table for us. Do you know what it is? It's going to be a communion table. Amen. The marriage supper. Jesus himself will pick that cup of wine up, present it to us. Think about it. Jesus himself is going to hand that cup of wine to you at your marriage ceremony in heaven. Matthew chapter 26, verse 29. He's preparing that wedding feast called the marriage supper of the Lamb. Oh, hallelujah. Jesus said, but I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. He's waiting to drink that cup of wine with us at our marriage ceremony. Revelation 19, 9 says, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. Jesus is waiting to drink that cup of communion with us in heaven when we become his bride. Revelation 22, verse 20, Jesus said, Surely I come quickly. And you and I say, Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Yes. Revelation 22, 17 says, The spirit and the bride say, Come. Yep. And we say, Yes, Jesus. Yes. We are waiting for you to come for us. We are waiting to become your bride. Tell everyone you see, I'm going to marry Jesus. I'm going to be his bride. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to become Mrs. Jesus Christ. Hey! Woo! I, I'm looking for that day, don't you? I'm going to be ready. I'm preparing myself. I'm weaving my garment. I'm laying aside the flesh. I'm dying to my will in order to be presented with that glorious wedding garment of righteousness clothed with his golden cloak of his nature, his righteousness that I have allowed him to form in me. Oh, I can't wait. Can you? But well, we've got to be ready. The bride has made herself ready. Yes. We can be the bridesmaids and be a part of the wedding. I don't want to be a bridesmaid. I want to be his bride. Don't you? And I want to end with this song. Tell everyone you meet that I'm going to marry Jesus. I'm going to marry Jesus. I'm going to be his bride, you see. For he is coming one day to get 
me. And I'll walk evermore at his side, for he has asked me, will you be my bride? And I said, yes, I accept your offer with pride, for with you I long to ever abide. In that day, the enemy will be found no more, for he cannot enter through heaven's door. For in that day with my bridegroom I will soar and walk continually upon that golden floor. I'll cross over into heaven's bright shore and sorrow and sadness will be no more. We will go together to the feast called the marriage supper of the Lamb and banquet at his table and let our praises resound. We will be joined by the heavenly host of angels that abounds, all together singing praises unto Jesus Christ, our Lamb. Amen.